Now, if you would take your Bibles, I would like you to turn to Psalm 133. You also have an outline in your bulletin, and I've entitled this message, Behold the Beauty of Unity. Now, normally in our church, we stand when we read the Word of God, so I'm going to ask you to stand, and I'm going to read to you this wonderful psalm, Psalm 133. A song of ascent of David. Behold, notice the trumpet blast, behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters dwell in unity. It's like, it's like the holy oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It's like, it's like the dew of Hermon which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Would you just in silence wait for a moment as we ask the Lord to open our eyes to this powerful psalm of David's. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for inspired words of Holy Scripture These are your words, not ours. They are profound. They have great impact upon us. And they will challenge us today. Open our ears. Open our eyes. May the truth move to our feet and to our actions and our conduct. May as we encounter these words of your own, that they will be life-changing and convicting to us today. Help us in our weaknesses. We ask these things in the name of our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. If you look at your outline, you'll see, first of all, the historical background to the psalm. As you can see, there's no inspired superscription that tells us the history or where this was written from. So I would have to say this to you, that this uh, psalm is timeless and universal. It's a psalm for today. It applies to all situations in which people work together and live together. It applies to your family. It applies to your church, to to your missionaries, to uh, Christian ministries. It applies to your job tomorrow morning. This is a psalm you can take home with you today and you can practice today. In fact, you may even want to, at the supper table, talk about this psalm together How would it apply to your family, to your social relationships? It's a psalm for today. Now, after Adam and Eve sinned, the curse came upon the earth, and the first sin recorded is the sin of Cain killing his brother Abel, and we have been killing each other ever since. The history of the human race can be traced through wars and divisions. Sadly, The history of the church of Jesus Christ is also traced in terms of wars and divisions. My dear, dear friends, we are fighters. We are warriors. We conflict. In fact, much of life you deal with conflict. George Verwer is the founder of Operation Mobilization. Over 5,000 young people throughout the world with this organization. It is said that George Verwer speaks in more churches in a year, sometimes up to 400 times, than any man alive. He's been an Urbana speaker several times. He's considered one of the most important youth mission speakers in the world. He's an amazing man. George Verwer, in a question and answer time, said this, finding a church in peace is like an oasis in the desert. Finding a church at peace is like an oasis in the desert. We are fighters. Every church in the New Testament had some form of conflict. And you will read the apostles' answers to how Christians should handle conflict. Now, in New York City, if you've ever been to New York City, you should visit the United Nations. It's quite an experience. It's the United Nations. But it's anything but united. In fact... In the one thing they're united, their sin, it will never allow them to unite. Do you ever hear people repent in the United Nations or say, we're sorry? No, everyone defends 
their own actions. So it is a psalm for today. It's very, very practical. Now let's look at the structure of the psalm. It's a very simple structure. It's a nice psalm for a, for a time of this uh, liking on Sunday morning because we can cover it very easily. Some of the psalms are very large and we take a lot of uh, time to cover them. The psalm is broken up into two parts. Verse 1 is the theme, it's the introduction, it's the main, main topic of the psalm, and it's unity, the beauty of unity, the quality of unity in the life of the nation of Israel. And then verse 2 and 3 are two illustrations to reinforce his point, the beauty and the goodness of unity. Now, David was not only a great king, a leader, and a warrior, he was a great teacher. Even Solomon in the book of Proverbs says he was taught of his father. In fact, probably many of these Proverbs were given to Solomon himself, who later recorded and collected Proverbs. David was a magnificent teacher, and we have the book of Psalms to prove that. Now, all good teachers know the importance of illustrations driving home a, a point. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ was the greatest teacher who ever graced this earth. When people saw Jesus Christ, they said this, teacher. That's how they identified him. It's interesting, throughout his whole life, whenever you see Christ, he's teaching, he's speaking, he's instructing. Teacher. And that's how we would see him today. He is the teacher par excellence. And as a great teacher, he's always illustrating. He has powerful illustrations. Now, if he were to give us a dictionary definition of loving your neighbor, you would hear it and forget it immediately. You've all learned that from school. Instead of a dictionary definition of loving your neighbor, he tells us the story of the Good Samaritan. It's an illustration. It will never be forgotten. So he's a great illustrator. Well, that's what David is doing here. He's illustrating. Now, the theme of the, the, the psalm, the theme of the psalm is the goodness and the beauty of unity. Now, there are two key words here in the psalm. The first word is good. The word good speaks of the inward quality of unity. It's intrinsically valuable. It's Inward quality is a quality of excellence and of goodness. Unity is a good thing. And then the second word is the word pleasant. Some of your Bibles may have a different translation, but it emphasizes the external. It's something very attractive. It's something very beautiful. Uh, its appearance externally is something you want to look at. And so the psalm literally begins with a trumpet blast. <laughs> Behold, look. Oh, I woke up some of you, didn't I? I saw, I saw you sleeping. I can see you. These lights might blind most people, but it doesn't blind me. Behold, look, pause, gaze, study, observe. Whenever you see unity, look at it. It's a good thing. It's an attractive thing. Study it. When you see unity, ask yourself, how did these people achieve such marvelous unity together? When you see a family at peace, ask, what's the secret to their peace? I remember as a young father with four children, there was a man in our church with six children, and all his children have gone on for the Lord. They were active in our church. And so one day I took him to lunch. I was beholding. And I said to him, I said, Don, Tell me some of your secrets as a father. I want to learn these things as a young father. And he told me very important things about raising children and his philosophy of raising a family. See, I was beholding unity, and I was studying it. I was examining it. I was observing it. That's what David has said. Look at it. You have a, a job to do, a responsibility. When you see a church living in harmony, find out how did they achieve this. How did the 12 apostles of our Lord in the book of Acts achieve unity? Now, after our Lord ascended into heaven, they were all alone, the 12 of them. What would 12 males do? Each of them, a strong personality who had already been fighting a number of times over who is the greatest, 
When people look at us, they know who the leader is. Who's going to take over after Jesus leaves? You know what would have happened naturally? I'm absolutely sure of this. There have been 12 denominations created. Well, there have been, of course, the Peter denomination. He was the man with the biggest mouth. He was the aggressive one. You always see him speaking. And then, of course, John, he's the beloved one, very tender and very close to the Lord. He said, well, I was closer to Jesus than anyone. He actually put his hand upon me and me, me the leader. Sorry, Peter. You just get us all in trouble. And then James, of course, he was very aggressive too. He's a son, son of thunder. And they would have fought over who's, who's the boss. They would have. You'd have 12 different groups. That did not happen. How is it didn't happen? We'll observe it. We know why it didn't happen. Why they did not have division is because they had the Holy Spirit, first of all. But Christ had given them marvelous principles of unity. He had told them you to be humble with one another. The greatest among you will serve the others. He told us to forgive and forgive the hurts and the, and the wounds of, uh, of one another. And he told us about loving one another just as he had loved them. He had given them profound principles. They were now to live based on those principles, and they were going to be powered by the Holy Spirit. That's how they lived in unity. Without those principles, they would have killed one another, guaranteed. So that's what we're doing now. We're beholding. We're looking at. We're gazing at unity. When you see a nation at rest, and if you watch the news, which you should watch the news because all Christians are internationalists, we have the great commission given to us, and the gospel is a worldwide global gospel, and so anything happening in the world will affect our missionaries and affect the gospel. So please be aware of world situations. They're not good right now. Did you know Christians are the most persecuted group in the world? You look at northern Africa, it's just horrible. I've talked to many missionaries in Nigeria and other places, and in Pakistan and, and Iraq today, China today. I hope as a church you're praying for persecuted believers. It's essential they know that all over the world there's solidarity with them, that there's unity with them in their suffering, being, being killed, being driven from their homes. Now, I know we like to complain about America. I mean, what else would we have to do? But we don't have tanks running through the streets. We don't have people coming in, breaking in right now. I was just a, a week in Russia and the, listening to the believers, uh, how they're under pressure. In fact, while I was speaking, there was a spy in every single uh, uh, time we were together. And just after I left, the missionary was, uh, the American missionary was put out of Russia. We don't even know this. We can hardly even understand this. Local officials uh, can just cause us torment, do basically whatever they want to us. How is it that we've had such unity in this country for its history? Now, two illustrations, and we'll spend most of our time on the illustrations. The first illustration is in verse 2. Let's read verse 2 again. It is like unity, the beauty, the, the goodness of unity. It's like, it's like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. Isn't that a marvelous illustration? You're all sitting here. I don't even know what he read. <laughs> Oil running down the man's beard. You know, I was talking to a group of teenagers and giving him this, this lesson. Youth, like this is used up here. And I, I noticed they were all laughing. I said, what are you laughing at? I said, boy, the oil will go fast down your head. <laughs> That's why I don't normally like youth at the meetings. <laughs> you can all stay. Going down on his beard, over all the holy garments, down to the edge of his robe. That's what unity is like. Well, what does this mean? Well, we're not really good students of the Old Testament. If you were, you would know this is a profound illustration of unity. So let's look at this here. First of all, he says it's like the holy oil. It's like the holy oil. Well, now we have to go back to Exodus chapter 30, and I put it in your notes to save us time. And in Exodus chapter 30, we are given the formula... Uh, for this a special holy sacred oil manufactured according to God's formula. And so in Exodus chapter 30, verse 23, we read these words. Look at it in your notes. Take the finest spices, liquid myrrh, 500 shekels, and of sweet-smelling cinnamon, uh, half as much, 250 shekels, and uh, 250 uh, of aromatic cane, and 500 of cassia, 
and a hin of olive oil. And you shall make of these a sacred anointing oil. Note that phrase. Mark it in your notes. A sacred anointing oil blended as by the perfumer. It shall be, note again, a holy anointing oil. It shall not be poured on the body of any ordinary person. And you shall not make you shall make no other like it in composition. It is holy, and it shall be holy to you. Whoever compounds any like it or whoever puts any of it on, on an outsider shall be cut off from his people. A very severe curse, an excommunication. This is a holy, sacred oil. Now, the occasion that he goes back to, you will see in Leviticus 8, verse 12, uh, David is thinking of that time in Israel's history, at the very start of Israel's history, when the entire nation gathers together, and Aaron is there, his sons are there, they have their brand new priestly garments on, they take this holy uh, oil that God has prescribed for them, and he took that holy oil and he poured it on Aaron's head, it ran down on his beard, on the, on the garments, on the breastplate with the names of all the children of Israel, and it ran all the way down to the edge of the robe, and then the, the odor of the uh, perfumed oil went up into the air, and the whole un- nation is united in absolute total unity at that moment. A very holy and sacred moment in Israel's history. Now, that's the illustration. What does he mean by it? Well, what he means is several things, but we only have time to look at three. The first thing that this means is that unity is like the holy oil. It's like the holy oil. In other words, it's sacred. Unity is a sacred thing. It's a unique thing. It's a special thing. It is not a common thing. Spurgeon wrote these words. What a sacred thing must brotherly love be when it can be likened to an oil which must never be poured on any man but on the Lord's high priest alone. In other words, you cannot take this holy oil and buy it for your wife at Christmas time and give it to her as a gift. You would be accursed. You could not use this holy oil for any common reason. It could only be used on the high priest and on the tabernacle and the utensils for setting these things aside. It was a sacred holy oil. Now, David is saying this. Unity is like the holy oil that would be poured on Aaron's head. That's how special it is. Now, sometimes to uh, grasp the meaning of something, let's look at the opposite. Disunity is an unholy thing. It is destructive. And Satan is the sower of discord. He's the master of division. And he's been at it a long time, and he's very successful at creating division. We read of the seven deadly sins in Proverbs 6. Let me read them to you, because you probably do not know the last of the seven deadly sins. There are six things which the Lord hates Seven, yea, which are an abomination to him. First is pride, haughty eyes. God hates pride. How can a human creature who is sinful be proud in front of an infinite personal creator being God? But notice the last of the seven deadly sins, one who spreads strife among the brothers and sisters. It's one of the abominations in God's eyes to spread strife among brothers and and sisters. Now look at your Old Testament. As you go through the Old Testament, you see how victorious Satan is in this area of dividing the people of God. The Bible begins with Cain killing, murdering his, his beloved brother out of just petty jealousy and the, the inborn hatred to his brother. And then you see the story of Jacob and Esau. In fact, this is almost humorous. Uh, Jacob and Esau are in the womb of their mother and they're fighting. At the time of their birth, the one guy gets the other guy's leg said, you're not going out, I'm going out first. Fighting over predominance. They fought ever since. And then you think of Joseph and his brothers, the horrible story of the brothers trying to murder Joseph, a righteous man. And, and the sin of that poor family and the heartache in that family 
Oh, it's a tragic story of a dysfunctional family. And then you think of Saul and David. Saul should have rejoiced at David. God gave him such a marvelous gift. Instead, he tries to kill him out of his jealousy. And you see Israel divided into the north and the south. Come to the New Testament and you see fighting in every single church, even that marvelous church at Philippi. And the Corinthians, who looked like they were going to secede from Paul's other churches, and the heartache they caused Paul, read 2 Corinthians. My dear brothers and sisters, listen and listen very carefully. Satan can use you to divide this church. He can use anyone who's willing, anyone who's naive. And we are not ignorant of his devices, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2.11. He can use elders. He can use deacons. He can use the pastors of the church. He can use you. Now, please, do not look around now and say, Oh, Lord, please let brother so-and-so hear this. He needs this message, Lord. No, no, I don't want you to do that now because I know what you're doing. Don't poke anyone either. <laughs> please apply this to yourself because you may be the instrument of the devil to cause disunity in your family and at work and in other places, and you won't even know it. So I want to ask you this. I want to tell you this. The next time you pick up the phone and you start talking about other people and gossiping about other people, I just want you to remember unity is a holy thing. It is a sacred thing. It's a special thing. There's nothing common about unity in people. Next time you make accusations against someone and, and you think you know what you're talking about and you don't really have a clue what you're talking about, you are making judgments about people and they are just that, your personal judgment. I remember for many years we had uh, a, a men's uh, uh, Bible, a Bible group that met on uh, Saturday morning for all the churches in the Littleton area. We don't have it anymore. And I remember the man who organized this was a lawyer, and he was a very good man, and um, he would always leave early, and he would slip out. And I remember one man one day was saying, you know, he's just a big shot lawyer. He, he's more important than us. He's got to leave early and uh, show us that he's so busy. Now, that was a man's judgment, and he was letting everyone know how smart he was. The reason that lawyer left early is because for 35 years his wife had suffered from crippling MS. And he had to get home, get her dressed, feed her every morning, and then go off to work. I remember one day he was talking to me and he said, you know, uh, I've had people say I should have divorced her. We really don't have a marriage. What do you think of that? I said, well, would she have divorced you if you had MS? He said, of course not. Well, why would you divorce her? God has given you her to care for, and what a glory. You will be so rewarded in heaven that you cared for your wife this way. And what a keeping of the covenant of marriage. I said, this is a privilege you have, and you've done a marvelous job. Don't ever back down. Now think of what that man said about this lawyer. It was a terrible thing he said, but it was just his judgment. Then someone else repeats and says, well, he's just a big shot. That's why he leaves early. He's not humble like all the rest of us humble people down here on earth. And yet that kind of stuff, I can tell you, after many years of being in a church, the rumors that go around a church, the rumor mongering and, and the stories that go around, most of them are judgments that people make. They're not true. There's no reality to them. I have personally learned in my own life, I don't believe anything I hear. If my wife tells me, if my children tell me, I tell them that's interesting until I talk to the person involved. Because I have heard so many false stories and rumors or misinformation passed around the church. When you hear misinformation or when you hear people's judgment about other people, remember this. Unity is a holy thing. And they're unholy at this moment. When you lash out in your anger and your self-justifications against your spouse or your children, I want you to remind you, unity is a holy thing. Now, Hudson Taylor started the China Inland Mission, and when Hudson Taylor uh, was in his mid-70s, he was completely worn out, a life of very difficult work. And he was to appoint a successor to the China Inland Mission, now Overseas Missionary Fellowship. And he picked a man about 35 years of age, D.E. Host. And people said, why did you pick such a young man? We have seen your leaders who have been here longer than he's alive. Why did you pick him? The story of why he picked D.E. Host is amazing. 
He picked him because he said he's young and he'll carry the mission the next 35 to 40 years, which is what happened, right into the communist era. And the other thing is, Mr. Taylor said, I've never met anyone who works with the Chinese better. He worked with Pastor Hazai, was a very difficult Chinese leader, and he was able to work with him well. And he said, that's the kind of man who will lead our mission. Anyway, D. Host, in his older years, was in England, and he was giving uh, Q&A time. And they asked D. E. Host, at this time, there's over 1,000 missionaries in the interior of China with um, the, the, the mission. And they said, what's the biggest problem you have in the mission? You might think it's finances. He said, no, the biggest problem we have in the China Inland Mission is tail-bearing, rumor-monging passing on gossip between missionaries, and most of it is half-truths, and it divides people. So the next time you pass on a story and you do not have the facts, or you pass on someone's personal judgment as if it's from God, will you just remember very simply, unity is like the holy oil. It is sacred. And you may be smashing that unity. Now, the second thing he says is unity begins at the head. It says it's poured on Aaron's head, and then it runs down the beard. What does he mean by that? Well, he means that unity begins in Jerusalem. It begins with the king. It begins with the priest. It begins with the elders. It begins with the, the, the noble families. And if unity is at the head in Jerusalem, it will spread throughout the whole nation. It begins with the leaders. You know the same thing is true of a nation, and that's why in uh, 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2, something we are not doing is a direct command of Scripture. Paul says, pray for those in authority. First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers and petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men for kings and all who are in authority. Is a direct command of Scripture that the local church pray for those who preside over us in official positions. The world will never know what our prayers have done. This nation does not know what the prayers of God's people have done for this nation. It is not easy being a leader of a nation. Thomas Jefferson was the third, pres uh, third president of the United States. But first, he was vice president. And he loved the job of being vice president. He enjoyed it thoroughly. And then he became president of the United States. And he said this, when he became president, he lost every single friend he had. He made so many enemies. In fact, at the end of his term of office, he said, I feel like a slave who just had my bondage broken, and now I'm finally free. It is not easy to be a leader of a nation. It's not easy to be a leader in a local church. If you make this decision, that group's mad. If you make that decision, that group's mad. If you make no decision, everybody's mad. You just can't make people happy. It's very hard to be a leader in the local church. You have to deal with people's sins. You have to deal with their divisions and their problems. And it, it's really endless. You don't, you don't know what goes on behind the scenes. You, it's better you don't. All the problems and the complaints. I, I think of dear Moses, that poor man. Numbers chapter 11, he said, Lord, what have I done to deserve these people? Please take my life. He was prepared for suicide. If you've worked in a church, you've probably said the same thing. What have I done, Lord, that I am burdened with these people? It's amazing how malicious God's people can be, especially when they're defending the Lord. And then leadership in the home. Our homes are all under attack. We need to be praying for the heads of households. God has made the man the head of the household. He's the head of the wife, the head of the children. And it's not an easy job, and since we're sinners, we usually do terrible things and use our authority wrongly. So pray for the heads of households. Pray for your families. Pray for your elders. I'll tell you a, a secret. If, if you're complaining about your leaders or if you're complaining about those who God has put over you, here's a good, uh, a good thing to do. Instead of putting them down, put them down on your prayer list. And get on your knees and pray for them. And I guarantee the Holy Spirit will convict you of your complaining and your attitude will be different. And that's why in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12 and verse 13, Paul says we are to esteem them exceedingly in love for their work's sake. So love them, pray for them, and you'll have a different attitude. 
And then unity is a diffusive thing. What he means by this is when there's unity in Jerusalem, when there's unity at the head, it will spread through the whole nation. When there's unity among the elders and the pastors together, it literally will spread through the whole church. It spreads right now into the Sunday school rooms. It spreads out into the community because every one of you have a circle of minimum 75 people. And you will tell your relatives and your friends about this church. And if this is a fighting church, it will get out in the community. I can tell you that from experience. One of our elders moved up into the mountains because of business and went into a small community, about 3,000 people. And he started asking people. And it was, um, he was amazed how the people in the community knew about the different churches. And there was a church right down the street from him. And he said, what about that church? Oh, the people said, that's a fighting church. When the new pastor comes, we bet how long he'll stay there. No pastor lasts more than two years. It, it's, it's known in the community. If there's peace in a church and God's doing things and the people love one another, they love coming, there's energy and excitement, it gets out into the community more than you possibly can realize. So unity has a way of diffusing itself and bringing everyone, just as the first illustration, Aaron and the whole nation gathered at that holy moment. Now, a second illustration. The second illustration is like the first, so we can move a little quicker. Don't be, don't be afraid. I promise to be done by 1 o'clock. <laughs> uh, verse 3, it's like, it's like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing life forevermore. Now, in Israel... The land is, uh, is arid. It's very dry. If you see pictures on the news, you see it's just all rock. What are these people fighting over all these rocks and this dry land? Well, there must be something about it that's causing people to say this is a holy place and we're going to die for it. Well, anyway, in a, in a dry land, uh, moisture on the mountain is essential to life. Now, you may know this or not know this, but if you drive into Colorado... It used to be on I-80. I don't know if it's there anymore, but I know it's on I-70. You drive into Colorado, and as soon as you drive in, there's this big sign. Now, do you know the sign? Colorful Colorado. And then for the next three hours, there's one color, brown. <laughs> and a few little cows or cattle just out there standing around looking for something to eat. Well, where's the color? It's not on the plains. The plains are very dry. The color's in the mountains where the snows, the copious snows come. And then it goes out to the streams and the canals and the rivers, and it goes down to the Colorado River all the way to, to Arizona and, uh, and Utah and, and California. All the way it goes. But you have to have the heavy snows. Now, this year we had wonderful heavy snows. And then this, this year, unlike the last two years, we've had a lot of rain. Everything's so green. You can just smell it. It smells so good. It's not that dry air that cracks your nails and cracks your lips. And you go, oh, where's the rain? Where's the moisture? Well, that's what it's like in Israel. The, the heavy dews and the, the snows on Hermon, well, it just causes great pastures and green grass and streams, flowing streams. And so in the hot summer, you drive your, your, um, your you lead your sheep up into the, the high mountains. It goes all the way down to Zion, to the mountain of Zion, which is Jerusalem. So in other words, the north and the south are all united by these lovely dews, and it brings light and enlivens and refreshes and invigorates life. It's a wonderful thing. Well, that's what unity is like. Ah, it's like the refreshing moisture in the air in a dry place. And you can smell the moisture, and it smells good, and it, it makes your skin feel good, and it brings grass, and it, it brings trees to life, and uh, animals have something to drink and to eat. It's invigorating. That's what unity is like. When there's unity in a church, there's growth in the church. The little finer gifts are all being used, and everyone loves being together. There's not that suspicion or, or uh, the tension and the hostility that happens in a church all too commonly. It's a refreshing, life-giving quality to unity. Now, if there was anyone who understood this, it was King David. Because when David became king, remember he first became king of Judah, and the nation was divided. The Philistines had killed Saul. They killed Jonathan. They basically took over the whole of the north. And there were two kings at the same time, two nations split. And there was Ishbosheth in the north, who probably took him five years to push back the Philistines before he became king for only two years. But the Bible says there was great hostility between these households. And David was king of Judah, 
and he was a good king. And then finally, Ishbosheth was dethroned, Abner was killed, and all the nation finally came together under one king, David. So he saw civil strife. He saw the weakness of the nation at this point. It was weak, it was faltering, and, and, and the powerful enemies of God were right there on the doorstep. I want you to just listen to this. David becomes king of the entire nation, and he's a good king. He's a king after God's own heart. The nation has experienced civil strife. It, it's weak now. The enemies are strong. So what does he do? The first thing he does is take a, a capital city for both the north and the south, Jerusalem, centrally located. Now, are you listening carefully? As a good leader... He knows the goodness and the beauty of unity. And so he gathers together throughout the entire nation, the leaders and the priests and heads of tribes, and he says, let us bring the ark to Jerusalem. For almost 70 years, the ark, which is the most sacred object in Israel's worship, it, it, it symbolized the presence of God. It had been sitting in someone's home. Saul neglected the things of God. He was not a godly man. David was a godly man. He loved God. He loved the law of God. And so he gets the whole nation together and the entire nation go and they get the ark and they bring the ark to a temporary tent that David builds and they bring it into Jerusalem. And the nation is singing and rejoicing. And the Bible tells us that he revived the Le Levitical choirs. He, he, he wrote psalms for them and songs to sing. He restored the priesthood. He restored the sacrifices. Literally, he made Jerusalem buzzing with priests and songs of praise. The Bible actually says that in the first uh, Chronicles 15, that it was filled with sounds of joy. Do you realize what David did? He made God at the center of the nation. He made worship at the center of the nation. And this unified the nation. It brought the whole nation together unto the Lord their God. And as there was this unity in Jerusalem with worship and the singing of the Psalms, the reading of the law, the teaching of the law, no wonder David said, I'd love to be there. I'd like to just be a, a gatekeeper there. It's such a marvelous place to be where God is being exalted and given his proper place among his people. And that unity would spread through the whole nation and it would spread out to all the nations because Israel was ordained of God to be a light of truth to the nations. If there was ever a man who should write this psalm, it's David who should write this psalm. He knows the beauty and the goodness of a nation united in worship. God at the center of this nation. And it worked. It was actually a very exciting place to be in an exciting time. Can you imagine the choirs and the instruments and they're all worshiping God? No wonder people would want to go there on their pilgrimages. Now the conclusion of this psalm, the conclusion. The conclusion is, for there, Jerusalem, the, there, there's now a unity because the, the, the moisture and the streams come down from Hermon all the way to Mount Zion, and there's been the spring together uh, like the holy oil upon the head. And he says, for there in Jerusalem, this very important place, the Lord commanded the blessing, life forever. It was God's will to have a city and to have a holy place and to be a light to a polytheistic, dark, dark world. It was at Jerusalem that the one and only and true God would be revealed to the nations. The law of God was there. The, the sacrifices were there. The true God was there. The light was there. And so in order to be the light to the nations, David knew it must be in unity. Disunity caused the light to go out. It had no power. It had no witness to the world. It was a big, giant mess. It was a disgrace to the nations. How good, how pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Now, how do we apply this to today because we don't live in Jerusalem? Well, if you look in your Bibles at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, I put the verse here, you will see that it says, So I write that you may know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God. Now, I want you to notice three descriptions of the church, the, lo the local church, 
He's describing us now. The household of God. We're the household of God today. It's a very special place you're in. Not in just some impersonal institution. It's a family. Big, giant family here. Extended family. And you know we're really a family. You know why? Not by bloodline. That's only temporary. By the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's in every one of us. And if the Holy Spirit's in you, you're connected to everyone else. And together, we're all connected to Christ in heaven. So we're all connected. Spirit connected. We're spirit people. We are real brothers and sisters. It's not just, you know, we belong to the Elks Lodge or uh, some philosophical club. We are a real family joined by the Holy Spirit, one people of God. We will be together forever, but we'll be sanctified, so don't worry. The household of God, now notice, it's the church of the living God, not a dead idol. We're a living, living stones. We're alive to God. That's what being born again means. You are dead, now you're alive. You have God's Spirit in you. You can really think for the first time. You can get some self-control. We have power over sin, reigning and ruling in our lives. But the last thing he says is this, the pillar and support of the truth. Now, this is important, and this is why I want to apply this. Every local church is a pillar and support or buttress of truth. What is that truth? The next verse tells us the gospel, Christ coming down to earth, incarnation, his uh, atoning work, and then ascending back to heaven, a message that must be proclaimed to the world. And so what Paul is teaching here is that every local church is a pillar holding up and buttressing the gospel and the message of the Son of God because the the gospel is concerning his Son, Christ Jesus. This is a very important place this morning. We didn't just drop out of bed and come here, got nothing else to do because we're a boring lot of people, or maybe you get free coffee here, who knows, and maybe you see your friends, or you know, you need a little touch of religion. Nice to go to church once in a while and make yourself feel good about yourself. No, we, we're an important group of people. Because we contain the message of the gospel, the only true God, the living God and his son and his plan of salvation. We are the pillar. We are the buttress. We protect and defend and proclaim this truth. It's not the University of Nebraska that is the pillar and support of truth. It's not your government here in Lincoln that is the pillar and support of the truth. It's not your scientific institutions that are the pillar and support of the truth. No, it is the local church. You have a very special, significant job to hold up and defend the gospel of the grace of God to sinners. So often we look at the news, we look at our magazines, and it looks like the most important thing in the world is Moscow or Washington, D.C. or or London or whatever is happening in Israel today. And the news just talks and talks about these uh, official people who are saying these things, and they seem like the most important thing happening on planet Earth now. But that's not true. The most important thing happening on planet Earth right now is the building of the body of Christ. If it was not for that, he'd kick the whole thing to pieces. He allows this world to go on because he's adding to his church. And we have that message of life forevermore. It is truth. It is God's central plan for the planet to build a church, to build a people, to build a body of Christ. We're involved in the most important thing. You won't read about it in Time magazine. Uh, Newsweek will not tell. Uh, Your local newspaper doesn't care that you're all meeting here this morning. They're all concerned about very important things like the weather and the stock market and uh, global warming. You are the pillar and the buttress of the truth. Now, just like with Israel... The verifying data of the gospel message is us. Is it true? Is it a reality to it? We're the data. We're the proof. If people look at us and we're hating and we're hostile and we hate one another and we fight it out and we say bad things about one another, the first casualty to church division is the gospel. First casualty. But if we love one another, as the Lord Jesus said, it's my new commandment. People will actually know you belong to me because you have this supernatural, uh, selfless, self-sacrificing love, just like mine upon the cross. You'll you'll actually give your life for one another. People will know you're mine. It it will be the the verifying data uh, proof 
uh, of the truth of the gospel. You, you love to be with one another. You love to be here. You've had long-term relationships. You've proven yourself to the trials and the problems and all the hurts and wounds of life together as the people of God. This is what draws people. You don't think it draws people? The, the navigators did a study of their college campus ministries. What was it that drew young people from college to be saved? Well, you might think great preaching. Uh, you might think wonderful programs, outings. When they talked to people who had been converted through their ministry, they found the number one reason that brought people to Christ is that these college students saw the Christians and saw them living together, their attitude, their disposition, and that was really appealing to them. What is different about these people? And that's what brought them to listen to the truth of the gospel. Every year, my wife and I, we have our anniversary, right? We, we, we were young and foolish. We got married Christmas Day. Don't do this. Don't do this. Learn from us. Don't do it. So we have to celebrate our anniversary right after Christmas. And so every year, we go to a certain hotel, downtown Denver. And at that very time that we cel celebrate our anniversary, Campus Crusade for Christ brings in 1,200 college students for the week, a whole week. Now think of this, 1,200 college students in a hotel, a nice hotel, for a week. What picture do you have in your brain? Drunkenness, uh, running up and down the halls at 2 in the morning, blasting music, people throwing trash all over, fighting, ripping up the walls. But every year... These 1,200 college students come, and the hotel employees say, it's like hardly believable. They're polite. There's no drinking. There's no loud music. They're, 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 they're so lovely to have here at our hotel. We love it every year they come. You know what? That's the proof that the message has changed them. They're not drunken kids. They're not irresponsible, undisciplined, just doing selfishly whatever they want. The gospel has changed them, and it's this wonderful unity among them, coming together, laughing together, having fun together, loving on one another, cooperating with one another, putting their own personal rights aside for one another, listening, growing, wanting to go out into the world with the gospel. It really touches the employees at the hotel. They can see something's different with this group. So what we learn in, in, in John 17 is our unity that becomes the power source of giving out the gospel. We give out the gospel. It's, it's a, a very offensive message today, if you're not aware of that. Fifty years ago, people could buy into much of what we believe. Not today. In our super modern secular society, our gospel message is despised. It's offensive. People who don't even want to hear it to become angry when you tell them of Christ the only way. It's, it's totally out of context, at odds with our society and the philosophical and cultural norms of our day. How are we ever going to talk to these people? Well, if they see a body of Christians loving one another, serving one another, sacrificing for others, they have to say something, something's there. And so our unity affects the power of the gospel. And that's exactly what David was saying. Our witness to the nations is, is nothing. It's zero. There's no light here. But by pulling the nation together, notice he pulls them together by putting worship at the center of the nation, putting God at the center of the nation. This now becomes something the whole the world talks about. Let me close with a wonderful story that I think illustrates what I'm talking about. I am not talking peace at any price. Uh, truth trumps unity. If there's a choice between unity and truth, you have to go with truth. Because there is no real unity without truth. It's the gospel that unites us. It's the truth of Christ that unites us. It's the word of God. Our unity is built on truth, not just some psychological gimmick to be happy in life or some utilitarian purpose. Let's all get together and be nice to one another. No, truth has united us, and we are the one people of God. But this psalm deals with the beauty of unity, so that's what we're dealing with now. And if you will look through Ephesians, you will look through Philippians and Colossians, you will see the apostle stressing unity and stressing Jew-Gentile relationship, free man-slave relationship. He addresses those things. Check that out. In fact, some have said the theme of Ephesians, which is the crown of Paulinism, is unity. 
God is concerned about unity. The Lord Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, not the troublemakers. It's a blessed thing to bring people together in unity. Let me tell you this story as we close now, and I promised you we would be done before 1 o'clock. When Ronald Reagan became president of the United States, he had as one of his goals to release a Jewish dissident in Russia named Anatoly Sharinsky. He wrote a very important book. Some of our own presidents have been affected by He's a politician in Israel, as far as I know, still today. And uh, he was uh, uh, confined to uh, 11 years in internal exile in Siberia, Russia. And uh, Ronald Reagan worked with Mikhail Gorbachev. They became somewhat of friends, and uh, they were able to work together. Uh, it produced that whole era of perestroika, freedom, openness, which is now closing. And uh, Ronald Reagan said, we would like to see the release of Anatoly Sharensky and allowed to go back to Israel. Well, they worked this out. And uh, if, you're, if some of you can remember this, reporters from all over the world were there when Anatoly Sharensky was released from the east to the west. He was told by the Russian guards, you know, you walk a straight line into Germany. Well, he went back and forth and zigzagged, totally defiant. So anyway, when he was released into the free world, he was surrounded by reporters. And um, one of the reporters said, uh, we heard that you were prepared to die for your Psalter. That's uh, the book of Psalms. You can call it the Psalter. And he had a small book of Psalms. And is that a true story? He said, oh, yes, it's a true story. I was out on the Siberian snow, and I was working, and the Russian guard took away from him his Psalter. And Anatoly Sharensky, being a true dissident, threw himself down on the Siberian snow, refused to get up unless he got his Psalter back. Well, the Russian guard knew this guy's prepared to die, and so he throws the Psalter down. Anatoly Sharensky takes it, brushes it off, puts it back in his pocket, and goes back. So someone yelled out from the crowd, What's your favorite psalm? Oh, Anatoly said, my favorite psalm is Psalm 133. How good, how pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. Oh, it's like the holy oil coming down upon the head. It's so sacred. It's so special. It's so unique. It's like, ah, the refreshing dews that fall on Hermon that just spread all the way down to Jerusalem, giving life and vitality to things. For there, the message goes out, life forevermore. And someone said then, well, why is that your favorite psalm? He said, because the one thing communism cannot tolerate is solidarity among people. When people are together and they're caring for one another and they're not passing rumors around and they're living that life of oneness together, communism has to do everything to destroy it. And then he told the story of how at night in his barracks, the men would all gather together. It was cold, and they would huddle together, and under a little tiny light bulb, he would read every night. They would read for a long period of time the Psalms. And as they were reading the Psalms, he said, we became one person, one man. We were united. We were prepared to die for one another. We were prepared to feed one another, care for one another. They could not destroy our unity, and our unity literally kept us alive. The same thing is true in the church. When we are united, loving one another, caring for one another, serving one another, putting aside those little petty grievances and our little tiny hurt feelings. Oh, I've been hurt. I'm going to write a book someday. I've been hurt. Because when people get hurt, they think they can divide the church, pass on gossip. They can lie. They can do anything. I've been hurt. It's an excuse to do whatever evil you want, malicious behavior. I've seen it. I've seen it in our own church. I've seen it in plenty of churches. People act just like the devil. They're the people of God. But when we're in unity and we forgive one another and we tolerate and, t and forbear with one another and we're, we're humble before one another and, and kind and gracious to one another, it brings us together and it gives us a solidarity that allows us to stand against this secular world. You can't, your family can't stand against this secular world. Your children cannot stand against this secular world. There is a secular tsunami that's run right over the USA. 
You cannot stand alone. It's not possible. But with the Lord's people and together as, as the congregation of God, as the household of God, as the, the, the congregation of the living God, as the pillar and the support of the truth, you can stand against this world. These young people cannot stand alone. They'll be washed away. Goodbye. We'll watch them go unless there is a community and a body of people that stand together and we, we hold up one another. And then there's power to our message. There's a reality to our lives and our message in, in a world that this world is so confused. They don't even know the difference between a man and a woman. They don't even know what marriage is. Basic human institutions, they don't even understand them. I'm telling you, I've talked to many young people. They're so confused today. You can tell them, we know the answer to those things real easy. You do? Where'd you get that from? Oh, a book called the Bible. It's pretty old, but it's been telling us since the beginning of time what marriage is, what a man is, what a woman is, what the family is, what the church is, the people of God, and the way of salvation, because the psalm ends with life forevermore. This church has a message. It has a message. It's not a do-gooder message. Come to church and be a do-gooder. The message is life forevermore. Jesus Christ, people say, oh, we like Jesus. He's not always nice. He's very nice. He was a great teacher, a great ethicus. Nice teachers don't say, I give to you eternal life. They don't say, if you do not believe in me, you'll die in your sins. Nice teachers. Lunatics. Crazy people. Mad people say those things. But Christ promised over and over, he will give the gift of eternal life. He will guarantee your eternal soul. He will forgive all your sins. He will make you right with God. He will bring you into a new family. He will give you his Holy Spirit, which will make you a brand new person. You will be born again. Good teachers don't say those things. The Son of God does. And he says them because they're true. It's the life forevermore. Think of that. We have the most important message in the world. It is the message of life forevermore, eternal life. Just this summer, we buried several people in our church. I guarantee you, one of them lived with us for six weeks as he was dying. He had no family. He didn't really talk about the stock market during those six weeks, and he didn't talk about global warming. He didn't even talk about the crime problem. He was interested in only two things the people he loved, and what's after this life. And when you come to the end of life, and you will come to the end of life, you will be only interested in two things. You will not say, I wish I spent more time at the office. You will say, what about my loved ones? And where do I go from here? Jesus Christ says, I will give you everlasting life. It will never end. And you will go to a new heaven and a new earth and the new Jerusalem. And God will dwell with you forever. That is quite a message. It is our message. We are the pillar and support of that message. We defend it. We preach it. We're prepared to die for it. It is the message of life forevermore. And part of that message is we've come the one people of God. And the principles for living together are humility and forgiveness and servanthood and love for one another. It is the true spirit of the church. So when people come here and they see that spirit, they say something's going on here. There's energy here. There's life here. There's something we don't see at the bar. There's something we don't see at work. There's something we're not seeing on the news. It is the pillar and the support of the truth. Life forevermore. Do you know that today, I have no idea, most of you, I have no idea who you are. You may have walked in here. Someone may have brought you this morning. Maybe you've been coming a long time but you don't have life forevermore. You're lost. And you're so lost you can't even hear me this morning because you're walking in darkness. So I'm praying the Holy Spirit will awaken you this morning, open your eyes and your heart to truth and to Christ, a person. We're not just about some philosophy. We're not philosophers. We're not theologians. We're talking about a person, the most wonderful person who ever lived, the reason for breathing. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who entered into this world for us to save us. He, saying, he said, I came to seek and save the lost. Not start an institution, not start a school. New philosophy. We've got plenty of philosophies. He said, I came to seek and to save who's lost. You're lost. I'm lost. We need a Savior. One of his titles is a Savior. So will you believe in him today if you will trust him and, and, and confess your sins to him and repent this morning? He loves to forgive sinners, and he'll bring you into his family. He'll give you immediately the Holy Spirit of God and the promises of eternal life. Look and believe and be saved. Will you stand with me as we close in prayer?
Can I give you one minute just of silence where you will speak to your God this morning, to your Savior. If you are not saved, I'm going to ask you to believe, to see Christ for who he is, to, to hear his words, which are truth. They are the words of the God the Father. There is a message here. There's a very important message here. This message has been since the beginning of human history of the one and true and only God who created all things. And when sin entered into the world, already a plan was in place to save sinners, lost people in darkness. And this plan has always centered on Jesus Christ, his beloved son from heaven, not on an angel or some philosophical reasoning, but on the most wonderful person, the God-man, Christ Jesus. If you will see him today and hear his message and turn to him and believe and cast yourself upon him, you will become a new person today. You will be born of the Holy Spirit of God. These are not our promises. These are the promises of Christ himself. Will you believe and be saved? Will you, as a child of God, this morning hear this message and know that unity is a holy thing? It is like the holy oil upon the head. It is like the refreshing moisture upon Mount Hermon to bring life and vigoration and, and, and goodness to the land. Will you see that this morning and put aside and repent of your, your hostility to your brothers and sisters and your little hurts and wounds and the ill feelings you have and the misunderstandings? They're almost endless. Will you put aside your battles and your wars and will you be a prayer person and will you be a, a blessed person of peace? Will you unite instead of divide? Will you be a problem solver and not a troublemaker? Will you look outside of yourself to the, 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 the common good of the church and to the common good of the message? Forget about yourself. Will you repent? Will you confess your sins if, if there's been disunity in your family and anger and cursing and harsh words to one another? Will you repent of that? Will you turn away from that? It's evil. It's malicious. It's hurtful to your children. It's hurtful to the testimony of Jesus Christ. Will you humble yourself this morning? Will you be united as God wants you to be united? Will you be a testimony to unity? Will you be a testimony to the power of the Spirit of God? Will you be a testimony to the Bible as truth? Will you pray this morning about this? Unity is like the holy oil. Our God, our Father, you have given us these words. We didn't make up these words. We are, we are troublemakers. We are, we are fighters. We're warriors. We're filled perversely with ourselves and our own little feelings and position and prestige and, and titles. We can't even stop thinking about ourselves. Help us to think of you and, and your, your church and your gospel Help us to get out of ourselves and, and to, to uh, practice the, the marvelous virtues of the Christian faith taught by our Lord himself. The virtues that characterize the early church and, and the 12 apostles. May we be an apostolic church today and be a, a good testimony today to our dark community. To those who hate the gospel, may they see power and may they see light and life. May they be a cause to awaken and, 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 and question what is it that is here. So I pray for this church. It's a wonderful church. It's had a long history, but may it have a longer history. May it be a glorious church and a church that brings great praise to your name and, and be a church that stands for truth and will not compromise for any reason. May it hold truth and may it hold love together in each hand. May there be a wonderful spirit and culture in this church. May we love as Christ commanded us to love. Now, for all these things, we need your help. We're weak. We're faltering. We'll forget these words two minutes after we walk out of this auditorium. We ask you to, to engage us in spiritual conversation when we are done. May we this evening review this lesson with our family. May we repent in front of one another for our petty, angerous feelings. 
May we be the people you want us to be. May this church be what you want it to be. May you commend it for its good virtues. And we ask these things because we know you hear and listen, and this is your will in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It's a great joy to be with you all today.